This is the Money Show on Sunday afternoon on the Genesis Communication Network, brought to you in part by the Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds. And this is Harry Brown with my good buddy, John B. Chandler. And we have uh, an hour ahead of us where we're going to talk about money, finances, savings, investments, anything having to do with money is fair game. And we have some questions that have come in uh, before the show through email, and we would be, we're going to take those questions, but we would be glad to take yours also. You can call in at 1-800-259-9231. That's 1-800-259-9231. Or you can email us. Just send an email to question at harrybrown.org. Question at harrybrown.org. John, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Harry. How are you this afternoon? I am just fine. Uh, What's the first question that came up? Well, Harry, we have some really good questions and topics this afternoon. Uh, we're going to be talking about cash, about oil, about the investment riders and how they affect the markets. We have questions and discussions about gold, silver, and even one, if we get to it, outsourcing jobs. So we have a long, exciting, interesting afternoon. And I should uh, remind our listeners, if we don't get to all these topics today, uh, be sure and join us next week because we will continue until we finish these uh, topics and questions and until we answer any of those that you may send in today. So here we go, Harry. Harry, the first question is from Stuart. His question or comment is something to this effect. Stuart says, someone told me that he has no bank account. Can you imagine? He uses money orders from the post office to pay bills. He doesn't have a credit card. He didn't say how he saves money or buys products. So I'm wondering, how could one run a household? without a bank account or credit card. How would one do so, Harry? Well, very difficultly, <laughs> if I may <laughs> coin a word. Um, I've heard this many times over the last, oh, gosh, 30 years, I guess. And I remember in the 70s that uh, people were worried about hyperinflation was going to be the breakdown of the currency, and uh, they were afraid that if uh, they had anything valuable that it might be confiscated. And so... Uh, they kind of retreated to the hills and uh, lived a very, very austere, difficult life. And that, in effect, is what Stuart's friend is doing. Uh, he is depriving himself of all sorts of benefits of civilization in order to protect his privacy in a more absolute manner than you or, my, you or I might want to. And it's a choice that uh, people make. I certainly am not going to make that choice and probably... Uh, there are no more than a handful of people listening to this show who would even consider it. But that's what it is. Now, the question of how do you run a household, well, you just have to go around paying cash for everything, and you have to try to get your uh, wages. If you, if you work for wages, try to get those wages paid in cash uh, so that uh, you don't have a check made out to you that goes through the banking system and leaves a paper trail. But... Um, I don't think that that's necessary. I don't think we are anywhere close to being in a position in this country where people have to protect their privacy on that kind of an absolute basis. But beyond that, I can't say. It's a personal choice. Yes, Harry, and I may have mentioned to you one time that I have a very good friend who operates exactly the same way, and he leads a glorious life. He has uh, two cars, two trucks. Uh, very nice home, travels extensively, and so forth. And his uh, purposes for doing it are uh, actually twofold. Number one is uh, privacy, uh, but number two also is is that it he says is it serves to force he and his wife into living within their means. It, it prevents them from uh, deficit spending like the government and. Uh, he simply uh, carries cash around and buys gas on trips with his credit card. He just pays cash and uh, uses a few money orders a month and uh, not concerned with with a bank, not concerned with credit card, not concerned with fees, not concerned with debt. He has zero debt. And uh, he, he's one of those types that debt, even for 30 months, 
uh, worries him, so he just doesn't have any, and he deals with in cash. But like you said, I, it's not something I'm going to do. Uh, it seems to me it's awfully convenient to use the uh, modern uh, tools of checks and credit cards and so forth, uh, but they, they should. I, we should always use them uh, judiciously. Uh, right. And uh, I think uh, if you use them judiciously and never spend more than you uh, can pay off, uh, it certainly does make life uh, more convenient. Yeah, he's, he's taken a, a tough road to keep within his means, a tough way of enforcing that. But uh, he may be used to it by now. I mean, you adapt to new circumstances, and the next thing you know, a month or two or six months has gone by, and it's as though you've always lived this way and never thought about doing it otherwise. Yes, the friend I have has been doing it for mm, probably 50, uh, 20, maybe 25 years. That's just the way he operates. Oh, my gosh. Does he have a job? Uh, he is a broker uh, and buys and sells, buys for cash and sells for cash. My heavens. Uh, buys and sells for cash with other brokers? Uh, yes, other, de- uh, other dealers. He's, he's, a, he's I'd call him a broker-dealer. Of uh, what, stocks, gold? Gold, silver, coins, uh, oh, I see. Well, precious just, metals, and things oh, like that. Oh, yeah, well, that that makes a difference. I was thinking when you said broker, I thought stockbroker. You couldn't possibly uh, execute a trade with Schwab, you know, by running over and paying cash every time and asking for cash when you sell something. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a little bit tough. Yeah. In any event, uh, the answer is is it can be done at great inconvenience, uh, and it does serve uh, some uh, purpose. Uh, and if that purpose is more important to you than the convenience, well, I would say yeah. have, I'd say have at it. But uh, I don't think it suits most purposes needs. No. Uh, but again, I think it always should be cautioned, and that is don't overuse credit. You do have to pay it back. Yeah, very definitely. Uh, and with regard to the convenience, uh, I, I must say that I don't even like writing checks anymore, and so I pay every bill that I possibly can on the Internet by going to the site of the company, you know, whether it's the cable company or the electric company or whatever. If they've got a site where you can pay the bill, I go there and do it. And if they've got a, uh, an automatic payment plan where they will automatically take it out of my checking account with my not even having to intervene in any way, then I'll sign up for that also. Well, and I like the idea of having a credit card or debit card with me, and I'm not the type that has more than one uh, gas card, uh, one credit card, one debit card. But mm-hmm. to me, and I don't use them often, but uh, I'm one of those types of people that could easily walk out of the house without any money. And it certainly is re- reassuring to know that uh, I can pay for my lunch if I have be one of <laughs> walking around without money. So uh, <laughs> uh, that's uh, that's just my style. Yeah, it's uh, nice that McDonald's takes credit cards now. Uh, it's nice that anyone does. <laughs> okay, Harry, that uh, should take care of that, and then some. Uh, we can go on now, if you like, to a very interesting question that came in from Sergey. Wagenau, I believe would be how you pronounce it. And uh, this is a question about uh, gold and oil and how they're related. Well, we'll look forward to that when we come back from the break. This is Harry Brown with John Chandler. The phone number is 1-800-259-9231. Throw any question at us you want and hope for an answer. Or email question at harrybrown.org. We'll be right back. This is Harry Brown. Have you lost money in stocks over the past few years? From 2000 through 2002, the stock market lost a third of its value. But during those three years, a bulletproof portfolio gained 9%. And over the past 34 years, such a portfolio gained an average of over 9% per year throughout periods of prosperity, inflation, and recession with no wide swings in value. My book, Failsafe Investing, shows how you can have that kind of portfolio for yourself. And now you can download the book for only $9.75. You don't have to rely on alleged market wizards or stay up late worrying about your savings. 
Failsafe Investing will show you how to have the security that you crave. Go to LibertyFree.com to see a sample chapter of Failsafe Investing, and then start protecting the savings you've worked so hard to acquire. That's LibertyFree.com. Welcome back. This is Harry Brown with John B. Chandler, and this is The Money Show, and our phone number is 1-800-259-9231, or you can email us, question at harrybrown.org. And, John, what's the question about gold and oil? We have a question from Sergey uh, that says, Greetings. You're wonderful, Mr. Brown. <laughs> and his question and comment begins, I'm about to buy a gold corp. Yesterday it was 2280. It is now 2350. It's crazy. Can you explain to me what the connection is between oil and gold? I don't understand this. Why is gold going up when oil is going up? The CEO of Gold Corp says gold is going to reach $500 an ounce before the year's out. Nobody I know can give me a, quote, valid reason for the connection between gold and oil or petroleum. I don't think any, quote, intuitive abilities can provide the answer. There's got to be a logical connection, even if the connection is psychological in nature. Thank you for your assistance, and good luck in answering this question. The last part was in the side by me. <laughs> well, good luck, uh, Sir J. Uh, the... Uh, the answer is that there is no valid reason for gold and oil to move together. Now, gold has a direct link to inflation because gold is the second most popular form of money in the world after the U.S. dollar. So when the U.S. dollar is threatened by inflation and we see rates of 5, 6, 8, 10 percent, then uh, a lot of people around the world dump their dollars and replace them with gold. And uh, that hasn't happened yet because we haven't had that kind of inflation in America yet. So gold is making all these sputtering false starts, and it's doing well in the mid-400s, but it's not taking off the way it was supposed to last year and the year before and the year before that. Now, that's a direct link. That's a, that's a, a, a valid uh, reason. That's a tie that has existed for uh, at least 35 years since gold was released from its $35 bondage. That's a, as I say, that's a direct link, but there is no link between oil and gold, except that when gold goes up because of inflation, oil and copper and toothpaste and a lot of other things may be going up because of inflation. But we don't have that inflation, so there's no reason for something else to be going up just because gold happens to jump up 5 or $10 or even 30 or $40, because we are not in a bull market in gold yet. And whether gold is going to go to $500 by the end of the year is something nobody can predict. Nobody can predict the future. Nobody knows what next year's inflation rate is going to be or what the Dow Jones is going to do. All we can do is to guess, and some of us will be right, and we'll trumpet it to the skies that we were right. Now, uh, as far as uh, uh, oil is concerned, what we've seen is oil uh, leapfrogging, not just inching its way up the way gold has been doing, but oil has been leapfrogging, which right there invalidates any connection between gold and oil. Right now it's oil that's uh, hot and gold is not, but at another time gold might be hot and oil will be not. Have I answered the question? Yes, you certainly have, but I'd like to borrow the soapbox for a minute or two, if I might. By all means. Key to this issue, and it's an extremely important issue, I believe, in the investment field, as well as in all of our life. And the key note to Sergey's uh, note was, quote, there has got to be a logical connection. And that is a very, very common uh, idea, mm -hmm. uh, is that when things are correlated, two things are going up or two things are going down or one thing's going down and something else is going up, 
for uh, a brief period of time. Are, yes, uh, it is natural for people to try to find a correlation. And, and Harry, once you did an extensive study on interesting correlations between uh, one thing happening, it looks like another thing uh, is related to it. And you, if you look hard enough, and with a computer it's easy to do, you can find thousands and thousands of correlations that look like they are connected. It looks like they're related. But I would point out that there's an entire field of philosophy that's associated with the idea of necessary connection. And that's related to cause and effect. And that gets back to some basic uh, logic that is, is very, very important to keep in mind in the investment field as well as throughout your entire life. And the basic logic goes back to a basic syllogism that says something to this effect, if P then Q, P therefore Q. What that really means is if it rains, the sidewalk will be wet. Someone looks out their door and sees the sidewalk wet, and they say, aha, it must have rained. Well, that is an invalid form of the syllogism. The syllogism was, if it rains, then the sidewalk will be wet. If it rains, it's proper to say the sidewalk is, will be wet. But just because the sidewalk is wet does not mean it rains. And that same connection, that same need to associate, same need to uh, tie things together, quote, there has got to be a logical connection, leads us down many, many, many false, invalid paths in investing, and in our lives. So please just remember that uh, there are thousands of things that are tied together by coincidence. They may seem to be correlated. They may, in fact, be correlated to a very high degree, but that does not mean there is any connection between the two. I'm stepping off the soapbox now, Harry, for your comment. That's very, very well put. I think you really summed it up, and and the icing on the cake is that these are connections that you cannot count on because they are just brief coincidences that happen to happen, uh, like ships that pass in the night. <laughs> and, uh, and if you count on them, then you are going down the garden path. And, boy, newsletters are so full of, uh, wow, this connection, or here's a, uh, uh, an absolute, uh, uh, oh, God, I've forgotten some of the words that are used. Uh, here's an absolute uh, uh indicator that uh, tells us exactly when gold is going to go up. Uh, if the money supply rises by X percent, then uh, gold is going to go up. And, you know, you see that it happened three times in the past. Wow. But then you bet a lot of money on it. And where did that money go? Well, you know, if you go to Las Vegas uh, long enough, it's going to come up red uh, five times in a row. Right. Uh, that does not mean there's any better than a little less than 50% chance it's going to be red next time. And, of course, the reason there's less than 50% chance is because of alt and double alt, which the House is very happy to have. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, we don't have any alts and double alts here. All we have are, we hope, answers to your questions. So give us a call, 1-800-259-9231, and we will be right back after these important words. This is Harry Brown. My book, Fail Safe Investing, will tell you what you need to know to create your own bulletproof investment portfolio, one that will protect you whatever the future brings, prosperity, inflation, recession, even depression, and it will protect you without your having to predict the future or tinker with the portfolio. Best news of all, at libertyfree.com, you can download the book for only $9.75. That's right, just nine seventy five. You can read the book on your computer screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. If you're tired of losing money on your investments, tired of the pressure of looking for the best investments, here's the way to have your own bulletproof portfolio, no matter how big or small your savings. To get a free sample chapter from Fail Safe Investing, 
Just go to libertyfree.com right now. That's libertyfree.com. Hello again. Harry Brown here with John B. Chandler, and this is The Money Show, brought to you in part by the Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds, whom you can reach at 1-800-531-5142 or by going to permanentportfolio.com. That's the Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds, plus our other good sponsors that make it possible for us to chat with you every Sunday afternoon at this time. And, uh, John, what's our next question that's come in? Well, it's not so much a question as it is a topic, an idea that has uh, been brought to our attention that I think needs uh, uh, considerable emphasis and uh, comment upon. Uh, I am going to begin the uh, topic with a quote. And uh, as I read this quote, uh, please uh, pay particular attention. Uh, Play like I'm reading it in italics. Low face underlined. <laughs> Capital letters. <laughs> no, no. Uh, because the quote is going to give rise to a, an important uh, discussion and an important point about the fallacy of investment writing and a fallacy that many, inv- many inv- investors fall into uh, daily, subconsciously, without even knowing it. So let's proceed with the quote. And this is a quote, has no point in calling any names, by a former financial writer uh, who wrote for a uh, financial magazine. And the quote is as follows. At the financial magazine I worked at, I wrote several columns that chronicle the latest investment trends, which tend to run in cycles. When mutual funds of a particular category or sector be they large-cap growth, emerging markets, or technology funds, made a precipitous ascent. That's when we reporters would take notice and write about them. And at that point, they were usually poised for a steep downturn. There is no telling how many readers had gotten in just in time for a free fall. That's the quote. Mm -hmm. Now... Uh, from there, uh, we uh, can note uh, a point, and one point is when any investment is going up, and any company stock is going up, any mutual funds going up, any investment sector is going up, uh, any particular individual uh, a small corporation or penny stock, anything of that nature is going up. That's when that particular investment public relations machine, that's when that engine gets really revved up. And that's when they start sending out PR releases to the media. And not only that, but the media jump on it because they're reporting this great uh, ascent that's taking place. It's news. It is news. Uh, And it's the type of thing that uh, we see every day in every uh, financial publication. And uh, as this particular writer said, at that point, they're usually poised for a steep downturn. Mm -hmm. Catch this. There's no telling how many readers have gotten in just in time for a free fall. I guess what needs to be said here is that an an investor would be uh, better off and uh, probably get much better returns by ignoring the financial newspapers and magazines and instead trying to find the next or uh, unknown sector rather than trying to find the hot sector at the moment. Right. Well, of course, this is where newsletters come into play. They figure that magazines like Barron's and Money and uh, others will be reporting on what has happened already, in effect, and even though there may be articles in there, interviews with investment advisors who say, I think the next big stock is going to be such and such or whatever. But once again, as he pointed out, the news is what has gone up. And newsletters, of course, try not to do that, but rather to uh, tell you that something is going to go up. 
And, uh, of course, my opinion about this is that neither one is something that can be counted on. As you point out, uh, or the writer pointed out, that once that thing is in the news, it's because it's already done a great deal of what it's going to do. Now, it might go up another 10% or 15%, but it also might go down 20 30 40%. And what you want is something that might go down 10%, but might go up 20, 30, 40, or 50, or 100 uh, percent. In other words, you want a low risk and a high reward, not a low reward and a high risk, which is the, the latter is what you get when you jump on something that's now become uh, public news. Uh, so I think what you're saying is that an investor uh, might be better served by trying to uncover undervalued assets that are ignored by the media and Wall Street in general. Definitely. And there is a whole, would you say, Harry, this kind of reminds me of the old contrarian line of investing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems to me that the contrarian line of investing, uh, rather than being uh, truly contrarian, what they really are is they are anti-major media. Yes, and uh, I really want to say a couple of things about that. Uh, first of all, uh, what we've said is valid, that once this is in the news, you do not uh, want to jump on it. But the, the next step after that is too many investment writers, uh, newsletter writers in particular, try to formulize that then, try to make an equation out of it, try to deal with it in some mathematical way, uh, in effect, that once this has uh, happened, uh, once X has happened, then Y is bound to follow. And that isn't true either. Uh, it doesn't necessarily follow that once something's on the cover of Newsweek or whatever it may be, that it is poised for a fall and that the fall is going to be X percent or anything of that sort. And uh, even more so, they try to formulize it by for instance, uh, counting the number of investment writers that are bullish and the number that are bearish. And if the number that are bullish exceeds uh, a following ratio of, you know, whatever it may be, then this thing is poised for a fall. But if the number that are bearish uh, exceeds the number that are bullish by the following ratio, then this is a buy. This is something to buy. But you can't do that. Investing does not come out of a mathematical formula. Uh, investing is the result, uh, investment prices are the result of millions, if not billions, of people's decisions around the world, emotional decisions, uh, financial decisions that they might change at a moment's notice. And um, it has nothing to do with the number of writers that are bullish or the number that are bearish. And there's no way you can enter the minds of those billions of people uh, you just have to work in the plain old-fashioned way by deciding that something is valuable because of this reason. And it may not go up today, but it ought to go up in the next month or two or whatever it is. And, of course, all we're talking about here are speculative investments, not investments for the money that really is precious to you, which I think should be in the bulletproof portfolio. All right, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes, and when we do... We've got some more interesting questions, and uh, we can take yours. I think we have time for, for one call at 1-800-259-9231. This is Harry Brown with John B. Chandler. We'll be right back. music means that we're all set to talk about our money and to do something positive with it. John, did you have something you wanted to add uh, to what I said? Well, I did, because I think uh, uh, we tended to leave our listeners uh, dangling a little bit when we said that an investor would be better served by trying to uncover undervalued investments 
that are ignored by the media and Wall Street. And if, if you want to get involved with speculative investments. That's right. And for whatever portion of your portfolio you want to, and it is the fun part of investing. It's more fun when you're young than you're old. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it is a fun point. But here's what I wanted to say, Harry, and that is, okay, great. Great going, you guys. You told us what we should do. Now, but you didn't tell us how you do that. Well, uh, well I want, we can't do everything. I want to offer just a little bit of help here, and that is uh, uh, last week we mentioned that we will be dealing uh, periodically with some speculative ideas and speculative suggestions by having uh, some investment writers, uh, newsletter writers, and uh, investment professionals own our show whose business it is to do, do just exactly that, and that is un- undercover undervalued asset and uh, so uh, just hang in there stay with us for another week or two we'll have uh, a series of investment advisors on who specialize in doing uh, just that finding undervalued investors so we're going to have some advisors on uh, the show that will help the listeners do uh, just that and that's find undervalued investments so I just want to let you know that uh, we don't throw out the problem without offering some semblance of a solution, and uh, we'll be having that uh, in the near future. So stay tuned, if you would. Yes, good, good, uh, good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Now, Harry, uh, we have a we have another a, a comment question, and that's concerning gold. And uh, the point was made that gold is now hovering around its 17 year high, uh, and point is further made uh, that that would seem to signal that worries about inflation and or inflationary pressures are increasing. If that is true, and they are, worries are increasing and inflationary pressures are increasing, does that signal a rise in interest rate and perhaps some uh, stock market problem? Well, first of all, I want to be off the track a little bit and just point out that a lot of investors and investment advisors believe that a rise in gold price signals a rise in inflation coming, and that's not true. Gold is no more able to predict the future than you or I, and I just wanted to make that point, that, uh, if, and that means that if gold is at a 17-year high and inflation hasn't taken off yet, the gold is more likely to go down than it is to go up in the near future. Uh, once inflation takes off, then all bets are off and uh, you, you want to be there. Now, with regard to interest rates, uh, certainly interest rates tend to rise when inflation rises because uh, lenders are just not, simply not going to lend money at uh, one rate and then see almost all of that rate eaten up by inflation so that they really get no gain whatsoever. And that means there's a, a lack of supply. And uh, that pushes interest rates up until it gets to the point where lenders are willing to come back into the market again. Yes, uh, and uh, if anything, gold does seem to me, Harry, to reflect not the prediction of inflation, but reflect something about the concerns about the possibility of inflation. That's very true. That what what it. The signals is that a lot of people think inflation is coming, but they don't know. And if inflation doesn't come, then they're going to see the gold go back down again. That's, and it, that's a good point. Yes, uh, and I guess the question that arose from this particular uh, uh, comment was: uh, Does increasing interest rates and inflation uh, signal problems for the? stock market if, in fact, those uh, concerns or anxieties about inflation come to pass, is that going to mean, uh, certainly, as you mentioned, uh, as you stated, uh, rising interest rates, and will that be a potential problem for stock market prices? Sure, very definitely. I remember in the 1960s, uh, the myth was that inflation was good for stocks that it would push the stock market up, and then in the 70s we had bad inflation, and the stock market was devastated, and and that myth died. <laughs> Excuse me. 
Well, uh, yes, and, and certainly as uh, returns increase on things like treasury bills, bonds, uh, CDs, uh, returns uh, go up higher and higher as a result of rising interest rates, uh, then uh, those higher returns siphon some money out of the stock market. Sure, it, it competes with the stock market and, uh, and uh, very definitely becomes more attractive because if you can get uh, maybe a, an 8% return or a 10% return on your stocks and you're getting 6 or 7 or 8% on treasury bills or treasury bonds or something like that, it's much, much safer to just keep the money in treasury bills and bonds uh, with no downside risk. But keep an eye on gold. Yes, of course. <laughs> okay, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes with uh, our final wrap-up, and uh, we want you to stay with us. This is Harry Brown with John Chandler. We'll be right back. But during those three years, a bulletproof portfolio gained 9%. And over the past 34 years, such a portfolio gained an average of over 9% per year throughout periods of prosperity, inflation, and recession with no wide swings in value. My book, Failsafe Investing, shows how you can have that kind of portfolio for yourself. And now you can download the book for only $9.75. You don't have to rely on alleged market wizards or stay up late worrying about your savings. Failsafe Investing will show you how to have the security that you crave. Go to libertyfree.com to see a sample chapter of Failsafe Investing and then start protecting the savings you've worked so hard to acquire. That's libertyfree.com. Harry Brown here with John B. Chandler, and uh, this is the final segment of the show, so before I forget it, I want to thank you so much for tuning in, and I want to thank John Harmon for taking care of everything in Burnsville, Minnesota, the site of the Genesis Communications Network, making sure that we stay on the air. And I do want to apologize, too, for some really bad fidelity of the last two or three weeks. Um, my phone system in the house that I just moved into has been much less than perfect. And we finally found a solution to it, and so I'm hoping you're hearing me without having to strain today, and I hope you can enjoy the show more as a result. John, do we have one last quick question we can wrap this up with? No. No? <laughs> We have a couple of questions, but neither one of them are quick. Uh, okay, so well, why don't you give us teasers and tell us what we'll be answering next week. All right, let's, uh, let's introduce uh, this issue. And the issue is, catch this, silver. Harry, it seems to me, looking over a variety of publications, newsletters, advisors, that silver is starting to get more attention. And... It wouldn't surprise me at all if it doesn't go on to get more and more attention, and there may be some good reason. First of all, I read that the historical ratios of silver to other things like oil, food, gold, and most everything else, silver is, is at historic lows. Another argument in favor of silver, of course, is the old... Uh, uh, most of the gold that's been mined is still around, but silver is being used up. There's more being consumed than is produced. And you get into the elasticity of uh, silver supply question. Uh, and I think next week uh, what we can deal with with some depth is the notion of silver being, is it in fact, uh, undervalued compared to uh, everything else, and uh, if it is, uh, that may indicate that uh, when an, uh, usually in economics, when an investment is at historical lows compared to everything else, that means it's uh, prime to go up. So we'll discuss uh, whether that is the case and whether uh, it is prime to go up or not uh, uh, next week, as well as uh, we can talk about the 
the fabled uh, silver to gold ratio, if that means anything. And uh, the fabled silver shortage. And the fabled silver shortage and uh, what happens when the uh, price of silver does go up. Uh, strange things happen out there in the world that, uh, <laughs> that no one, uh, very few people uh, forecasted, predicted, but uh, something comes out of the woodwork. So next week, let's uh, talk about silver. Uh, I will take us off there. Harry, if you don't mind, I'm John Chandler, uh, Harry Brown's sidekick. We're certainly happy to have you here this afternoon, and we hope you'll stay tuned next week where we'll be discussing silver, its uh, ramifications for the future, other questions, as well as, if we get to it, the outsourcing of jobs and production and what means to us. Meanwhile, we hope you'll stay tuned. We hope you'll come back to business next week. Send us some questions. We'll be happy to try to happy happy to try it. Come back, sweet papa.